Welcome everyone to another episode of What's Working in E-Commerce. I'm your host, Egan Heath. I'm the owner of Caravan Digital. We're a digital marketing agency for direct-to-consumer e-commerce brands. So check us out if you're interested in paid search, paid social, or email automation. Today I'm speaking with Scott Brown and Tim Swindle from Paddle Smash. These guys have a lot of expertise in developing products and particularly in the gaming space, so I'm excited to learn more. Scott and Tim, welcome. Nice to be here. Thanks, Thanks Egan. Egan. Tell me a little bit about how you guys connected over this product or how you two got together making a product. Uh, so I, I was in software. Uh, I was a partner in a software start, startup in Chicago and uh, I was a sales software. And on the side, uh, it's kind of a passion project, side hustle. Uh, came up with a board game, like a physical board game um, akin to like a Cards Against Humanity. It was kind of a drinking game, uh, to be honest. And um, so just had this itch I wanted to scratch with bringing that to life. And so I did. I did a little Kickstarter with it. Um, didn't crush it, but, you know, got funded. Um, and then I went to, you know, continue pushing the ball down the road and got in touch with uh, through a mutual friend. I was introduced to Scott, um, who owned and operated a uh, retail uh, toy and game company. And uh, so he was actually the first retailer to carry my game that I had launched called Utter Nonsense. All right. That's great. Anything to add to that, Scott, or anything else you want to fill in? I'd say just my story, kind of quick and dirty background, is that I was in Chicago working at a business incubator and they were looking for new concepts. And we came up with this concept of a brain health store and wanted to test it out. We found cheap available space in downtown Chicago in the fall of 2008. So it just kind of set the stage for what that what was happening there. It's this Bear Stearns crashing. This is like the start of a recession. Um, not a great time to launch a concept, but I will say it also opens opportunities, and the opportunity for us was a really prime, prime brick and mortar retail location. So we opened that that store and immediately got great, great kind of feedback from customers. We had lines out the door. Our store store was just packed, and so we like looked at each other. This is me and some co-founders, and we're like, you know what? I think we might have something here. We ended up opening a, a few more stores. And over the course of 10 years, we opened 40 stores across the US. So we had a ton of stores, all selling kind of educational toys and games that was called Marbles the Brain Store. And uh, as Tim mentioned, we were always looking for kind of new up and coming brands. I saw this game of his, we put it on our stores and it was like an immediate success for us as well. So that's how our two worlds collided. Pretty interesting. I don't know if it's just me, but this sounds like a dream, you know, developing and selling games. So. Tell us a little bit about that. You guys have launched a lot of products over the years and you're obviously a lot of like fun brands and, you know, it really in this kind of fun game space. Talk to it. Talk to us a little bit about, you know, how do you how do you develop, you know, market and sell a game? <laughs> well, I think we're in agreement with what you just said, Egan, which is it is fun. And, um, you know, after doing, you know, Utter Nonsense, which was my first foray, I had no prior experience being in the game space, board games, etc. cetera. Um, just a quick further background to that. So ended up getting it into not just Scott's stores, but also it, picked up, it, was, it was picked up by Target, Walmart, Barnes and Noble, some of the bigger players, um, and then eventually uh, sold that company to a large private equity backed uh, toy and game company by the name of Play Monster. And, um, so in doing that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I was, I was in software prior to that. So I had two very different worlds I was exposed to. One was VC backed software, cash burning, high growth, very stressful, managing big teams. And then there was this like silly board game. And I'll tell you what, the board game's a lot more fun. <laughs> and um, so kind of committed to that as, as, as my career would continue on. I was like, I want to, Sounds a little cheesy, but like I want to bring fun to the world, uh, and so games does that for people, uh, brings people together. Um, and a another downside to it is that I say even if we're not successful monetarily, I'm still having fun thinking of the product, coming up with the products, creating the products, etc. And so to me, that's worthwhile. Yeah, I mean, I think I'll just add, add to that and and say that in this space, we're exposed to thousands and thousands of ideas. Um, so it's a, it's a volume game in the toy and game world. The way it typically works is inventors come up with concepts and they'll pitch them to these 
these game manufacturers and they have to kind of sort through all of the ideas and find the winners. And so I would say over the course of the whatever 15 years I've been doing this, I've tried to refine my, I guess, my antenna for what makes a game great. You know, there's a lot of ideas that get thrown out there and the hard part of the business and particularly in what Scott had done in his prior life was evaluating those concepts. And so, you know, seeing hundreds, if not thousands of concepts, you know, on an annual basis and being able to pick out the needles in a haystack really that, you know, may be the next hit. Um, and so, um, you know, I think that's kind of the interesting thing in the game space is that there's a lot of ideas out there, but very few of them stick and very few of them hit. And that's kind of, you know, our job is to identify, you know, what is going to next would be that next big winner. Yeah, that's kind of my feeling is this this is a total renaissance of everybody's playing board games on the weekends and the week. I'm going tonight to play with my family. Um, obviously, a lot of outdoor games. This is a great time for it. I imagine there's a lot of potential supply as well. You know, how, how do you stand out? How do you, you know, identify that next big opportunity or create the next big hit? That is the million dollar question is how to stand out. And I think, you know, what we're all doing, there's no new, it's sort of like there's no new recipes. It's just rearranging of food. And that's what it is in this Twain game space. There's no new ideas necessarily. You're sort of just rearranging things. And so what we're all looking for is kind of picking elements of great things, mashing together and seeing if they work. But I mean, there is no secret sauce for making sure you have something that works. I mean, we're all just trying to find something that, that resonates, but you're right. We are in a renaissance of board games and outdoor games. It's amazing to see the resilience of this industry. You know, everyone worried when when digital games came out, when, you know, first video games, everyone thought it would be the death of physical games, and it wasn't. And then everyone thought when apps came out, it would be the death of physical games, but it wasn't. I think we all inherently want to put down our devices and play face to face. And so we're big believers in that. And I think everything we do is kind of in the physical space looking for ways to, to connect. I wanted to ask about that too. It sounds like with the store then, you were getting this face-to-face -face feedback. People were coming in and loving it. You're able to get them to try things. You know, if you're in the e-commerce space, how do you get people to try the game and play it that first time? I mean, you're right with our stores. That's what was be beautiful about it. We had everything open for demonstration. People could try before they, they bought. At the same time, we had an e-commerce store and we tried to replicate some of that experience. So we had a video with every single product we had of one of our employees talking as if they were talking to a customer in the store. So you couldn't physically touch it, but you got that in-store experience. And I'd say that's a big key to what we're trying to do is just show as much as we can about what it's like to play with our product and talk to the consumer like they're face-to-face -face with us. So it sounds like video is really key there. Yeah, video, video is key. And another thing from kind of the, the product development side of things that I think you were asking about earlier is, uh, you know, one, one thing we're doing is also looking for trends in the market. Um, and so with our latest product uh, that we're launching here in about a month, Paddle Smash, um, you know, we're looking at, you know, what's happening with outdoors games, outdoor sports. Um, you don't have to look very far to see that pickleball is exploding. And so that just kind of continue to catch our eye. Scott happens to be a really big pickleball player. Um, and so, uh, you know, just looking at trends in social media, trends of what's going on. And, you know, with this latest game, it was like pickleball is exploding. Uh, the product itself is kind of a hybrid of pickleball and spike ball, another really popular outdoor game. And so we're kind of combining those two worlds together. Uh, like Scott talked about, they're always, it's always an iteration of something or a combination of two things uh, that tends to be, you know, what, what is the next product? I'm glad you said that because, you know, I started life here as, as a marketer, as an SEO guy, and then got into Google ads. And so it was always kind of tapping into existing demand. And so I really admire entrepreneurs and product designers like you, where you're, you're creating something new and in some sense you need to generate the demand. But also what I'm hearing there is this isn't like there's no category for this. It's not like there's no precedent for what you're going to have people doing. It's, just, it's, it's an iteration on something proven and there's a fresh flavor to it as well. Exactly. 
Yeah, I think that's it. I think it's smart to find something that is familiar, that's an anchor point for people. Whenever a customer would come into my store and I would show them a new game, I'd always find something that, that they were familiar with. So if it was a trivia game, I'd say, well, you know Trivial Pursuit. Well, this game's like that, but here's how it's different. Um, and so there was always that anchor point, and I think it's good to have that. And, and then from the SEO side, I mean, you, you know this, but to have a game trending like Pickleball and to be able to ride in some ways the coattails of that, um, you know, both in the digital space and in the physical space, you know, we, we now can go to pickleball tournaments and advertise our product. You know, tomorrow I will be at a three day pickleball tournament advertising my product. And there's going to be a bunch of other vendors selling paddles and balls and bags, but we're the only thing that's kind of an iteration, slightly different. And I think that helps us to stand out. We're not kind of, uh, me too's of all of the, yeah, everyone's, it's a gold rush towards pickleball right now. But we're, we're trying to find something that's a slight twist that makes you stand out in this space. Pretty fascinating. I just, my, my wife loves pickleball. She's trying to get me to play it. I haven't tried it yet, but I'm looking forward to it. And there was just an article in the New Yorker about the professionalization of pickleball and kind of the different leagues and the tournaments and stuff. So you're, you guys are definitely hitting on something. You've got your thumb on something in the culture. So I love it. I, this is not a marketing question, but I'm just curious, again, as someone who fantasizes about doing what you guys are doing, what does the testing look like? You know, like how, how much, you know, iteration are you doing on the product before you launch it to market? You, you know, and th this one was a little bit interesting. I'll speak specifically to, you know, Paddle Smash where Scott and I actually didn't invent this game. Uh, this, we were coincidentally trying to come up with something very similar when uh, Scott was introduced through a mutual connection to this gentleman, Joe uh, Bingham, who lives in Utah, not too far from Scott. And he uh, he's a structural engineer by trade and has seven kids. And so he actually came up with this concept and um, basically, you know, being a structural engineer, um, you know, his kids had all loved spike ball. Uh, that phase had kind of grown out and he wasn't really able to participate in that uh, with that with them. Uh, and then they all loved pickleball. And so pickleball courts, 20 minutes away, crowded, hard to get to. Um, whereas, you know, he wanted to play with them in the backyard not feasible to build a pickleball court in your backyard. So him being the structural engineer, combined both those worlds and um, basically, you know, started creating a prototype of what is now Paddle Smash. And so that process is not too dissimilar to what we see with other products. He took um, some big sheets of plastic and kind of glued them together. You know, he had existing pickleball, you know, paddles and balls, so he's able to use that. And then he just kind of rudimentary, rudimentarily, uh, that's the right word, um, attached a net to this thing, enough to ch just try the concept, right? So you think of something in your head, and then it's like, what's the cheapest, most rudimentary way that you can test your idea and get other people testing it, you know, to get that feedback loop going? I suppose that's the, that's the hardware and the rules of the software, and that part can maybe change and get updated. Yeah, so he just tested over and over it was really over the course of a couple of years that he refined the prototype to become what we saw. So I get pitched ideas all the time, uh, maybe a couple of weeks, someone will call me, wanna show me an idea. Um, it, you know, it's rare that something really piques my interest, but this one did, I went and tried it. I was like, all right, there's something here. And I called Tim, I was like, Tim, there's something here. Tim trusts me, but Tim's like, I wanna, I wanna try it myself. He flew out to Utah. Um, we had a great time just playing it one-on-one -on -one, and then we played it two-on-two -two with my family and it was like, all right, there's something real here, but let's see if we take it to an environment outside of our family unit, like if we get the same response. So I'd say that's a big tip to someone developing an idea. Um, toy game, anything outside of that space as well, is when you're showing your idea, make sure you show it to people that don't know you and love you. And when you show it to them, don't tell them that it's your idea. So when we take this, took this concept down to the local pickleball courts, we set it up, it was like flies to honey. I mean, people were stopping their games and coming over and asking us what, what we were doing. Um, and we said, instead of saying, well, this is our idea, we wanna see what you guys think. We said, well, we're, you know, we're businessmen, we're trying to decide if this is good or not. An inventor sent it to us to evaluate, help us out. Like, is this any good? And we all played it together and it was like, 
I mean, exactly what you're looking for in a market test. It was like crowds forming. It was a guy playing and then going home to bring his son back so his son could try it. It was people offering to buy the prototype from us. It was like, all right, there's something real here. And these people didn't know and love us. And so I think from that point, we were like, all right, there's something. Um, we've got we've to go for it. So we licensed the idea from these, this inventor. And now we've spent the last year bringing it to market. Yeah, what a great story. I'm kind of picturing in the, the movie The Founder when Ray Kroc is meeting the McDonald's brothers and sort of testing this out, like, all right, this could be a whole thing. So very exciting. I'm curious, if can you say a little more on the bad pitches on just like, not just the pitches, but the uh, maybe the products that people brought to you and they weren't good. Are there other common mistakes, you know, game designers are making? And then just how do you know when you've got a while? Let's say it's even before you've tried it out and you've seen in the park and the results, you know, like what is that? Is it some gut thing you can't describe or what's the difference between, you know, a bad potential game and a good potential game? Yeah, so I mean, cautionary tales, I'd say mistakes made by inventors. Biggest would be spending too much money before you find out if anyone would even like the idea. So, you know, it's common that I'll find someone and they'll say, I've got this game, my friends and family love it, and I just spent $30,000 to pr produce, you know, 3,000 pieces of it. And, you know, that worries me. I'm kind of like, you know, I, what I would recommend to anyone is to kind of spend the minimum viable amount um, and make the minimum viable, viable prototype um, and then test with people that you don't know, as I've already said. Um, so when people pitch to me, um, big red flags are, the, the first question I always ask is, have you played it with anyone outside of friends and family? And if they haven't, that's a major red flag for me that they haven't done the work necessary to find out if it's a really good idea. Um, I'd say, you know, other red flags are um, too complicated. Uh, you know, I think all of this stuff has to be explained on the, on a box w within three to five seconds. You know, I think for a game to be successful these days, direct consumer is viable, but really still you've got to get it on that mass market shelf and it has to be able to sell itself. So if they can't pitch me their idea in call it 20 seconds, sort of the elevator pitch, it's going to have a rough go, I think, on a brick and mortar retail shelf. So those, those would be just a, a few of the big red flags for me. Thank you for talking about that. On the retail side and then the direct to consumer side, can you just talk about the differences there? It sounds like you've got some great experience doing the retail side. You've done some e-commerce now and you're launching this. You know, what's, what's the difference and how do you approach those differently? I mean, I think the world is shifting dramatically. Um, and I don't think we all have a grasp on what this new reality is. The old reality was that for a product to be successful, you had to play with one of the big players. Um, quick, kind of quick story from my background. After I had these, these stores, these 40 stores, they were acquired by a big Canadian uh, manufacturer. And I went to work for that company for three years. And this company was all about big mass market players. So it's the Walmarts and Targets of the world, okay? We would spend $150,000 and really a year worth of development before even showing the product to mass market um, to the buyer. We did this with one product. The buyer came in, she was tired from a late night the night before and was just in a bad mood. We showed her this product, like li literally it was our key product and we had spent gobs of money to get even ready to show her. And she said, you know, guys, I'm in a bad mood. I'm tired. Just show it to me later. I'm, I'm not in a spot to evaluate. She left. The head, of, the head of sales came back in and said, tear this out of the display. It's dead. We're killing it. She's not interested. And, and that's devastating. And that is a lot of money and time spent. So that's the old reality. And what the old reality is if a buyer says no, you're out. Um, the new reality is you're not as desperate for their, you know, love. I would still say that we would love to be in mass market retail, but what we want to be able to do with direct to consumer is to, is to have a proof of concept, to have less risk and to have more leverage. So when we can put this product out into the world and get a bunch of Amazon sales and a bunch of direct to consumer sales, instead of us going and begging at the feet of these buyers, 
we have leverage. They come to us. They say, well, we're seeing this. I promise you, these buyers are watching Amazon. I know it. They've told me they're watching Amazon. So if you can show viability on Amazon, you have a lot of leverage with these mass market retailers. So that's the, that's the shift in the world from old where you are so desperate and begging to new where you can create leverage yourself. It's something Seth Godin talks about is basically the gatekeepers are gone. And if they're not gone, they're going to be gone. I'm curious. I see. I think you guys are both parents. I, this is kind of an aside, but how do you think about that of should your should kids learn not just to please the teacher, but like to get broader buy in on what they're doing and, you know, sell it to more than one person? Yes, I would say is the, is, is the answer to that. I mean, it's, it's an interesting concept that I've not uh, considered before. And, and my daughter is, you know, just turning three, so not quite school age. So I'd have to think through that a little bit. Um, but, you know, I think what we're learning is that there's just there's more than one way to do things. There's more ways to skin a cat. Um, and like, I like that scrappy as an entrepreneur, I like that, you know, you can control your own destiny. Um, if you're willing to think outside the box, I know I'm using a lot of, uh, euphemisms or whatever here, but I, it's just, it's true, you know, and, and like the, what you're describing with like the teacher is the ruler and you've got to appease the teacher. It's like, what we're learning is in real life is that, okay, well, you know, just because one person doesn't like it doesn't mean that you're a failure. Uh, you have other ways of proving yourself, um, which I think is really, is an exciting time. I've got four kids, 15 down to six, and I'd say one of our best parenting learnings is uh, how to respond to kids coming to you for validation. And I think it's really easy as a parent to say, that's amazing, that's awesome, like way to go. Um, and I think often, so what we've tried to do more of lately is when one of our kids comes and shows us something and it asks us for feedback, the first question we ask is, well, what do you think about it? And how do you like it? And I think it gives them a chance to just kind of think themselves and evaluate the concept themselves before getting the immediate feedback. And not, I mean, be truthful in your feedback. You don't have to be harsh in your feedback, but I think be truthful. And I think it creates a little bit more resiliency and ability to stand on your own feet and justify. So I guess a real world example would be that my daughter created a game. Um, she, it was like coming to me for feedback and I was like really trying hard to not be involved in this because ultimately she wanted to present this to toy and game companies and I didn't want me to be involved in that. I wanted it to be purely her so she could say I created this. So she and a buddy teamed up, they created a game they would come to me for feedback and most of the time I'd say like, well, here's what is not working and working, but try this and just they would experiment and then they would go and test it out with other people outside of me. I mean, I am like kind of the perfect sounding board, but I didn't want to be their sounding board. Ultimately, they presented this at the Chicago Toy and Game Fair. There's a competition with students and they there were over 200 concepts and there's one. It actually won the competition and they got it published and it, was in Target stores and it's still in brick and mortar retail. You can go to Barnes and Noble and find their game, bet you can't. So she was, you know, at the time she was nine, nine or 10 years old, um, developing it with her best friend and they have a game in Target. And I think a lot of it was just this resiliency of her belief that she could do it, which was really fun to see. Wow, what a great story. Thank you for telling that. And thanks for talking about that. I'm glad I, I'm glad I asked a little bit. So we, we mentioned a bit of how much things have been democratized here with direct to consumer. How do you guys think about this? I'm curious, what have you learned in the past? I know you've got some experience with influencer marketing and Kickstarter and things like that. Talk to me a little bit about, you know, what you've learned in the past about direct to consumer game marketing. And then also, you know, how are you guys approaching it here for Paddle Smash? Yeah, I mean, on the one hand, you know, it's never been easier to be an entrepreneur, you know, because you can go direct to consumer, you can spin up a Shopify website, you can go sell on Amazon. Um, and so that's incredible. The downside of that is that the crowded, the market's got more crowded. Um, there's a lot of people out there now. So how do you stand out? How do you separate yourself, you know, uh, from the crowd? Um, so one of the things that, you know, we've done uh, recently is, you know, we've, we've paired up with um, influencers. Uh, in, in particular, there was a game that Scott and I had launched last year. It was like a trick shot game. Um, again, the way that, that came to life was, uh, again, looking at trends within social media. We saw how ping pong trick shots had gone viral on social media, people in their basements, you know, throwing a ping pong ball 
off of their you know books and shelves and walls into a bucket and we came out with a product that does that um, called alley hoopster and you know we were sitting there having the same conversation of like how do you you know how, how do you you know, rise above the crowd and um through a mutual connection and we were introduced to a youtube influencer a guy named Tristan Jass, T Jass has like 5 million followers on social media and um, basically you know, developed a relationship, a business relationship with him to help promote a product. You know, he's got 5 million followers. Um, that's a pretty easy way to tap into a market um, to get exposure for your product. Um, and then in the flip side, you know, they're obviously re rewarded for that monetarily. Um, but that's just one of the ways that we've explored um, to kind of help separate ourselves, you know, from, from the market and from the crowd. Tim, I'm sorry if I missed this, but how did you identify he would be a good influencer for that product? Uh, so we were thinking of ideas with the, the thought in our head also of teaming up with an influencer. So this was a topic that was top of mind for Scott and I. And we shared this with a, a friend of ours of how we're going to start developing some game concepts and trying to team up with influencers. It just so happened the particular person we spoke to um, was also uh, friends with this influencer, Tristan. And so he was like, oh, that's interesting. Um, maybe there's an opportunity there for you guys to work together. So that's kind of how that one came to be. It was, it was totally by chance. We just were having a conversation and, and he made a warm introduction and then we kind of took it from there. Sounds like it was a nice, some nice serendipity, some nice networking. I'm curious, was the content he already had, you know, did, did, was it, did it align well with your brand? Was it, were you trying to reach the same people? I'm curious about that piece. It, it did. I mean, so this, this particular person is a like trick shot artist. Like that's what he does. So he creates trick shots, uh, but with a, like a basketball trick shots. And so um, one, one of the concepts we were already work, working around with was ping pong trick shots. So, it, you know, we're kind of bringing those two worlds together um, and it, it is very tangential to what he's doing. And we kind of themed it up as a basketball, you know, ping pong, ping pong trick shot game. And um, so it, it did work where, you know, it wasn't like we were, I don't know, doing something that was totally off brand for him. I mean, this was a, you know, a, a very easy transition. Scott, anything you've seen? Yeah, well, I just wanted to add, you know, at the risk of being too transparent, that's been a mixed bag for us. Um, I, yeah, it's been a mixed bag. I'd say that one, one potential learning is that uh, sometimes these bigger influencers are so busy and also motivated by, you know, the money that they get from kind of doing what they're already doing, that it is hard to get them to do what you're hoping they will do. And there's been a little bit of that in, in this process, if, if we're being completely honest. And I think one kind of, I guess, one learning we're taking from that and now applying to Paddle Smash is that we're not identifying these massive influencers with this product. You know, it's interesting. You see these kind of ebbs and flows and the movement of people to different things. And so there was this massive movement to direct to consumer and to Amazon. And, you know, then when there was the, uh, you know, Facebook has been such a great place to market your product. And then there's, you know, with the iOS update, it's made Facebook incredibly expensive. So that whole kind of mass of people quickly started to shift towards influencers. And these influencers knew it and their price tags just shot through the roof. And so now you're seeing this whole group of people say, well, where now? And, you know, I don't know that there's an answer, but where now for us with Paddle Smash is to identify micro influencers, so smaller groups. One, I, you know, one example is just this last week we came across a guy on Inst Instagram who focuses on outdoor games. He's got four thousand followers. He's not massive, but that also means he's not expensive. All he's looking for is a free product, and he'll promote our product. You know, he'll kind of take it, he'll play it, he'll show video, and what then we can do is is kind of seed that out to a bunch of micro influencers where we're not have to spend money to, to, pay, to pay them. It's just the, the cost of product. And in exchange, we get a bunch of content. And that content is king right now. You're taking that content and you're pushing it to, to TikTok. You're pushing it to Instagram and Facebook. And I think that's maybe the secret sauce right now. Um, not so secret because I think a lot of people are going there. But uh, I think that's what we're hoping with Paddle Smash is that we can kind of get it out there um, Tim has a nice phrase about kind of luck. Tim, remind me what the phrase is. 
You want to increase your surface area of luck. Yes. So increasing the surface area of luck. I like that. So we're kind of spreading the luck around and then, you know, you kind of cross your fingers and hope that something, something pops. But our belief is that if you get it in enough hands and get enough content out there that you can reach a tipping point with the product. I think you highlighted some good things there in terms of, I don't know if it's CPMs or the effectiveness of paid social is that, is that gets more challenging. The influencer space becomes an alternative, obviously as, as dollars go there, then the prices go up too. So if I'm understanding you right, you're doing a bit of both. You guys are going to have an organic and an influencer strategy, and you're going to be doing some paid social to launch this. Is that right? Yep. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Phenomenal. All right. Well, guys, I hope you'll take my call when I have a game to pitch. <laughs> um, I'm very excited to play all these games you mentioned today, and I'm excited to see Paddle Smash. You know, is there anything else I should have asked you about, and where can people find you? I mean, I think the last thing is just, you know, we're, we're set to take pre-orders right now. The website is live. Um, we'll have product in early September. You know, it's always dependent on the, uh, the shipping. We just... We never know when it's going to arrive exactly, but early September and uh, can't wait to get this out there into the world. So paddlesmash.com. Right on. Anything else to add, Tim? No, thanks again for, for having us. Egan. appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for connecting, guys. We'll have to have you back on after the launch and we can, we can talk then. So I, I want to get the update and I'm excited to play it. So thanks for coming on and sharing what's working in e-commerce. Thanks, Egan.